The Independent Labour Party ILP was a British political party of the left, established in 1893, when the Liberals appeared reluctant to endorse working-class candidates, representing the interests of the majority. A sitting independent MP and prominent union organiser, Keir Hardy, became its first chairman. The party was positioned to the left of Ramsay MacDonald's Labour Representation Committee, founded in 1900 and soon renamed the Labour Party, to which it was affiliated from 1906 to 1932. In 1947, the organization's three parliamentary representatives defected to the Labour Party, and the organization rejoined Labour as independent Labour publications in 1975. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Organizational history. Background As the 19th century came to a close, working class representation in political office became a great concern for many Britons. Many who sought the election of working men and their advocates to the Parliament of the United Kingdom saw the Liberal Party as the main vehicle for achieving this aim. As early as 1869, a Labour Representation League had been established to register and mobilise working class voters on behalf of favoured Liberal candidates. Many trade unions themselves became concerned with gaining parliamentary representation to advance their legislative aims. From the 1870s a series of working-class candidates financially supported by trade unions were accepted and supported by the Liberal Party. The Federation of British Unions, the Trades Union Congress TUC, formed its own electoral committee in 1886 to further advance its electoral goals. Many socialist intellectuals, particularly those influenced by Christian socialism and similar notions of the ethical need for a restructuring of society, also saw the liberals as the most obvious means for obtaining working class representation. Within two years of its foundation in 1884, the gradualist Fabian Society officially committed itself to a policy of permeation of the Liberal Party. A number of so-called Lib Lab candidates were subsequently elected members of parliament by this alliance of trade unions and radical intellectuals working within the liberal party the idea of working with the middle class liberal party to achieve working class representation in parliament was not universally accepted however Marxist socialists, believing in the inevitability of class struggle between the working class and the capitalist class, rejected the idea of workers making common cause with the petty bourgeois liberals in exchange for scraps of charity from the legislative table. The Orthodox British Marxists established their own party, the Social Democratic Federation in 1881. Other socialist intellectuals, despite not sharing the concept of class struggle were nonetheless frustrated with the ideology and institutions of the Liberal Party and the secondary priority which it appeared to give to its working class candidates. Out of these ideas and activities came a new generation of activists, including Keir Hardy, a Scot who had become convinced of the need for independent labour politics while working as a Gladstonian liberal and trade union organiser in the Lanarkshire coalfield. 
working with SDF members such as Henry Hyde Champion and Tom Mann he was instrumental in the foundation of the Scottish Labour Party in 1888. In 1890, the United States imposed a tariff on foreign cloth which led to a general cut in wages throughout the British textile industry. There followed a strike in Bradford, the Manningham Mills strike, which produced as a byproduct the Bradford Labour Union, an organisation which sought to function politically independently of either major political party. This initiative was replicated by others in Colne Valley, Huddersfield and Salford. Such developments showed that working class support for separation from the Liberal Party was growing in strength. Further arguments for the formation of a new party were to be found in Robert Blatchford's newspaper The Clarion, founded in 1891, and in Workman's Times, edited by Joseph Burgess. The latter collected some 3,500 names of those in favor of creating a party of labor independent from the existing political organizations. In the 1892 general election, held in July, three working men were elected without support from the Liberals, Keir Hardy in South West Ham, John Burns in Battersea, and Havelock Wilson in Middlesbrough, the last of whom actually faced Liberal opposition. Hardy owed nothing to the Liberal Party for his election, and his critical and confrontational style in Parliament caused him to emerge as a national voice of the Labour movement. <laughs> <laughs> Founding Conference At a TUC meeting in September 1892, a call was issued for a meeting of advocates of an independent labor organization. An arrangements committee was established and a conference called for the following January. This conference was chaired by William Henry Drew and was held in Bradford 14-16 January 1893. It proved to be the foundation conference of the Independent Labour Party and MP Keir Hardy was elected as its first chairman. About 130 delegates were in attendance at the conference, including in addition to Hardy such socialist and labour worthies as Alderman Ben Tillett, author George Bernard Shaw, and Edward Aveling, son-in-law of Karl Marx. Some 91 local branches of the Independent Labour Party were represented, joined by 11 local Fabian societies, four branches of the Social Democratic Federation, and individual representatives of a number of other socialist and labour groups. German socialist leader Edward Bernstein was briefly permitted to address the gathering to pass along the best wishes for success from the Social Democratic Party of Germany. A proposal was made by a Scottish delegate, George Carson, to name the new organization the Socialist Labour Party, but this was defeated by a large margin by a counterproposal reaffirming the name. Independent Labour Party, moved by the logic that there were large numbers of workers not yet prepared to formally accept the doctrine of socialism who would nonetheless be willing to join and work for an organization established for the purpose of obtaining the independent representation of labor. Despite the apparent timidity in naming the organization, the inaugural conference overwhelmingly accepted that the object of the party should be to secure the collective and communal ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange. The party's program called for a range of progressive social reforms, including free 
unsectarian education right up to the universities the provision of medical treatment and school feeding programs for children, housing reform, the establishment of public measures to reduce unemployment and provide aid to the unemployed, a minimum wage law, welfare programs for orphans, widows, the elderly, the disabled, and the sick, the abolition of child labor, the abolition of overtime and piecework, and an eight-hour work Day, the keynote address of the Foundation Conference was delivered by Keir Hardy, who observed that the Labour Party was, "...not an organization but rather the expression of a great principle, since it had neither program nor constitution." Hardy emphasized the fundamental demand of the new organization as being the achievement of economic freedom and called for a party structure which gave full autonomy to every locality, and only seeking to bind these groups to such central and general principles as were indispensable to the progress of the movement. The conference also established the basic organizational structure of the new party. Annual conferences, composed of delegates from each local unit of the organization, were declared the supreme and governing authority of the party. A secretary was to be elected, to serve under the direct control of a central body known as the National Administrative Committee NAC. This NAC was in turn to be made up of regionally appointed delegates who were in theory confined to act according to the instructions given them by branch conferences. Early years The new party was founded in a social environment of great hope and expectation. However, the first few years were difficult. The direction of the party, its leadership and organization were heavily contested and the expected electoral progress did not emerge. The party did not fare well in its first major test of national support, the 1895 general election. With the NAC taking a lead in organizing the party's contests, and with finance tight just 28 candidates ran under the ILP banner. A special conference decided that support could be given to either ILP or SDF candidates, which brought a further four contests into the picture. None was elected, however, with even the popular party leader Keir Hardy going to defeat in a straight fight with the Conservatives. The electoral debacle of 1895 marked an end to the unbridled optimism which had attended the party's foundation. From its beginning, the ILP was never a homogeneous unit, but rather attempted to act as a big tent party of the working class, advocating a rather vague and amorphous socialist agenda. Historian Robert E. Dowes has observed, From the beginning the ILP attempted to influence the trade unions to back a working-class political party, they sought, as Henry Pelling states, collaboration with trade unionists with the ultimate object of tapping trade union funds for the attainment of parliamentary power, the socialism of the ILP was ideal for achieving this end, lacking as it did any real theoretical basis it could accommodate practically anything a trade unionist was likely to demand. 
fervent and emotional, the socialism of the ILP could accommodate, with only a little strain, temperance reform, Scottish nationalism, Methodism, Marxism, Fabian gradualism, and even a variety of Burkean conservatism. Although the mixture was a curious one, it did have the one overwhelming virtue of excluding nobody on dogmatic grounds, a circumstance, on the left and at the time, which cannot be lightly dismissed." Of course in a party of loose and diverse opinions, the essential nature of the organization and its program would always remain a matter of debate. Initial decisions about party organization were rooted in an idea of strict democracy. These arguments did have some impact, as the conference held to set policy prior to the 1895 general election and the abolition of the position of party president in 1896 testified to the power of such arguments. Nonetheless, the NAC came to possess considerable power over the party's activities, including hegemonistic control over crucial matters such as electoral decisions and relations with other parties. The electoral defeat of 1895 hastened the establishment of centralizing and anti-democratic practices of this kind. In the last years of the 19th century, four figures emerged on the NAC who remained at the center of the party shaping its direction for the next 20 years. In addition to the beloved party leader Keir Hardy came the Scott Bruce Glacier, elected to the NAC in 1897 and succeeding Hardy as chairman in 1900, Philip Snowden, an evangelical socialist from the West Riding, and Ramsay MacDonald, whose adhesion to the ILP had been secured in the wake of his disillusionment with the Liberal Party over its rejection of a trade unionist candidate in the 1894 Sheffield Attercliffe by-election. While there were substantial personal tensions between the four, they shared a fundamental view that the party should seek alliance with the unions and rather than an ideology-based socialist unity with the Marxist Social Democratic Federation. Following the failure of 1895, this leadership became reluctant to overextend the party by running in too many electoral races. By 1898 the decision was formally made to restrict electoral contests to those where a reasonable performance could be expected rather than putting forward as many candidates as possible to maximize exposure for the party and to accumulate a maximum total vote. The relationship with the trade unions was also problematic. In the 1890s the ILP was lacking in alliances with the trade union organizations. Individual rank and file trade unionists could be persuaded to join the party out of a political commitment shaped by their industrial experiences, but connection with top leaderships was lacking. The ILP played a central role in the formation of the Labour Representation Committee in 1900, and when the Labour Party was formed in 1906, the ILP immediately affiliated to it. This affiliation allowed the ILP to continue to hold its own conferences and devise its own policies, which ILP members were expected to argue for within the Labour Party. In return, the ILP provided a good part of Labour's activist base during its early years. The party matures 
the emergence and growth of the Labour Party, a federation of trade unions with the socialist intellectuals of the ILP, helped its constituent parts develop and grow. In contrast to the doctrinaire Marxism of the SDF and its even more orthodox offshoots like the Socialist Labour Party and the Socialist Party of Great Britain, the ILP had a loose and inspirational flavour that made it relatively more easy to attract newcomers. Victor Grayson recalled a 1906 campaign in the Colne Valley which he was proud to have conducted, like a religious revival, without reference to specific political problems. Future party chairman Fenner Brockway later recounted the revivalist mood of the gatherings of his local ILP branch gathering in 1907. On Sunday nights a meeting was conducted rather on the lines of the Labour Church movement. We had a small voluntary orchestra, sang Labour songs and the speeches were mostly socialist evangelism, emotion in denunciation of injustice, visionary in their anticipation of a new society. While this inspirational presentation of socialism as a humanitarian necessity made the party accessible as a sort of secular religion or a means for the practical implementation of Christian principles in daily life, it bore with it the great weakness of being non-analytical and thus comparatively shallow. As the historian John Callahan has noted, in the hands of Hardy, Glacier, Snowden and MacDonald socialism was little more than a vague protest against injustice. However, in 1909 the ILP laid the basis for the production of agitational material with the establishment of the National Labour Press. Still, the relationship between the ILP and the Labour Party was characterized by conflict. Many ILP members viewed the Labour Party as being too timid and moderate in their attempts at social reform, detached as it was from the socialist objective during its first years. Consequently, in 1912 came a split in which many ILP branches and a few leading figures, including Leonard Hall and Russell Smart, chose to amalgamate with the SDF of H. M. Hindman in 1912 to found the British Socialist Party. Until 1918, individuals could only join the Labour Party through an affiliated body, the most significant of which were the Fabian Society and the ILP. As a result, particularly from 1914, many individuals, particularly ones formerly active in the Liberal Party, joined the ILP, in order to become active in the Labour Party. While affiliated body membership was not required after 1918, the presence of MacDonald and other leading Labour Party figures in the ILP's leadership meant many converts to the Labour Party continued to join through the ILP, a process which continued until about 1925. The ILP and the Great War On the 11th of April 1914 the party celebrated its 21st anniversary with a congress in Bradford. The party had grown well in the previous decade, standing with a membership of approximately 30,000. The rank and file membership of the party as well as its leadership were pacifist, now as ever, having held from the beginning that war was sinful. The guns of August 1914 shook every left organization in Britain. As one observer later put it, 
Hindman and Cunningham Graham, Thorne and Kleins had sought peace while it endured, but now that war had come, well, socialists and trade unionists, like other people had got to see it through. With respect to the Labour Party, most of the members of the organization's executive as well as most of the 40 Labour MPs in Parliament lent their support to the recruiting campaign for the Great War. Only one section held aloof. The Independent Labour Party, the ILP's insistence on standing by its long-held ethically based objections to militarism and war proved costly both in terms of its standing in the eyes of the general public as well as its ability to hold sway over the politicians who ran under its banner. A stream of its old members of parliament left the party over the ILP's refusal to support the British war effort. Among those breaking ranks were George Nicol Barnes, J. R. Clines, James Parker, George Wardle and G. H. Roberts, others held true to the party and its principles. Ramsay MacDonald, a committed pacifist, immediately resigned the chairmanship of the Labour Party in the House of Commons. Keir Hardy, Philip Snowden, W. C. Anderson, and a small group of like-minded radical pacifists, maintained an unflinching opposition to the government and its pro-war Labour allies. The 1917 Russian Revolution Conference in Leeds called for the complete independence of Ireland, India and Egypt. During the war the ILP's criticism of militarism was somewhat muted by public condemnation and periodic episodes of physical violence, which included a wild scene on 6 July 1918, during which an agitated group of discharged soldiers rushed an ILP meeting being addressed by Ramsay MacDonald in the Abbey Wood section of London. Stewards at the door of the ILP meeting were overpowered by the mob, who in what was described as a riotous scene, broke chairs and wielded their parts as weapons, seizing the auditorium and dispersing the socialists into the night. Topic: The ILP and the Third International. Following the termination of World War I in November 1918, the Second International was effectively relaunched, and the question of whether the ILP should affiliate with this renewed Second International or with some other international grouping loomed large. The majority of ILP members saw the old Second International as hopelessly compromised by its support for the European bloodbath of 1914, and the ILP formally disaffiliated from the International in the spring of 1920. In January 1919, Moscow issued a call for the formation of a new Third International, a formation which held great appeal to a small section of the ILP's most radical members, including economist Emile Burns, journalist R. Palm Dutt, and the future member of Parliament Shipperji Saklotvala, along with Charles Barber, Ernest H. Brown, Helen Crawford, C. H. Norman, and J. Wilson. They called themselves the left wing group of the ILP. The conservative leadership of the ILP, notably Ramsay MacDonald and Philip Snowden, strongly opposed affiliation to the new Comintern. In opposition to them, the radical wing of the ILP organized itself as a formal faction called the Left Wing Group of the ILP in an effort to move the ILP into the Communist International. 
The faction began to produce its own bi-weekly newspaper called The International, a four-page broadsheet published in Glasgow, and sent greetings to the conference which established the Communist Party of Great Britain, although they did not attend. In addition to cutting its ties with the Second International, the 1920 annual conference of the ILP directed its executive to contact the Swiss Socialist Party with a view to establishing an all-inclusive international which would join the internationalist left-wing socialist parties with their revolutionary socialist brethren of the new Moscow International. In a letter dated 21 May 1920, ILP Chairman Richard Wallhead and National Council member Clifford Allen asked a further set of questions of the Comintern. The Executive Committee of the Communist International ECCI was asked for its positions on such matters as demands for rigid adherence to its program, applicability of the dictatorship of the proletariat and the Soviet system to Great Britain, and its view on the necessity of armed force as a universal principle. In July 1920, the fledgling Comintern gave an unequivocal reply, while the presence of communists inside the organization was acknowledged, and their membership in a new communist party welcomed, there would be no joint organization with those like the Fabians, Ramsey MacDonald, and Snowden, who had previously made use of the musty atmosphere of parliamentary work, and petty concessions and compromises," on behalf of the labor movement. These leaders have lost touch with the wide unskilled masses, with the toiling poor, they have become oblivious of the growth of capitalist exploitation and of the revolutionary aims of the proletariat. It seemed to them that because the capitalists treated them as equals, as partners in their transactions, the working class had secured equal rights with capital. Their own social standing secure and material position improved, they looked upon the world through the rose-colored spectacles of a peaceful middle-class life. Disturbed in their peaceful trading with the representatives of the bourgeoisie by the revolutionary strivings of the proletariat they were the convinced enemies of the revolutionary aims of the proletariat. The ECCI instead made its appeal directly to the communists of the independent labor party, noting that the revolutionary forces of England are split up," and urging them to unite with communist members of the British Socialist Party, the Socialist Labour Party, and radical groups in Wales and Scotland. The emancipation of the British working class and of the working class of the whole world depends upon the communist elements of England forming a single communist party. The ECCI declared the agitation for affiliation to the Third International of Moscow came to a head in 1921 at the annual conference of the ILP. There an overwhelming vote of the party's branches voted not to affiliate with the Third International. This decision was followed by the exit of the defeated radical faction, which immediately joined the CPGB, the centrism of the ILP, caught between the reformist politics of the Second International and the revolutionary politics of the Third International, led it to leading a number of other European socialist groups into the Second and a Half International between 1921 and 1923. The party was a member of the Labour and Socialist International between 1923 and 
Topic: The ILP and Labour Party governments 1922 to 31. At the 1922 general election several ILP members became MPs including future ILP leader James Maxton and the party grew in stature. The ILP provided many of the new Labour MPs, including John Wheatley, Emmanuel Shinwell, Tom Johnston and David Kirkwood. However, the first Labour government, returned to office in 1924, proved to be hugely disappointing to the ILP. This came despite 30% of the cabinet holding ILP membership. Of the most prominent of these figures, Ramsay MacDonald was removed as editor of the ILP's Socialist Review in 1925, and Philip Snowden resigned from the ILP in 1927. Topic: 1928 policy conferences. The ILP's response to the first Labour government was to devise its own program for government. Throughout 1928, the ILP developed a socialism in our time platform, largely formulated by H. N. Brailsford, John A. Hobson and Frank Wise, the program consisted of eight policies The living wage, incompletely applied A substantial increase of the unemployment allowance The nationalization of banking, incompletely applied the bulk purchase of raw materials The bulk purchase of foodstuffs The nationalization of power The nationalization of transport The nationalization of land off these eight policies, the living wage, the unemployment allowance, nationalization of banking and the bulk purchase of raw materials and foodstuffs were the chief concern of the ILP. Increasing the unemployment allowance and switching to bulk purchasing were to be done in the conventional way, but the method of paying the living wage differed from labor practices. The ILP criticized the continental method of paying wage allowances from employers' pools, which had been implemented in 1924 by Rhys Davies. The ILP proposed to redistribute the national income, meeting the cost of the allowances by taxing high-income earners. The nationalization of banking involved more significant changes to economic policy, and had nothing in common with labor practices. The ILP proposed that once a Labour government took office it should hold an enquiry into the banking system that would prepare a detailed scheme for transferring the Bank of England to public control, revise the operation of the Bank Acts and ensure that "...control of credit is exercised in the national interest and not in the interest of powerful financial groups." by making creditors shift entirely to checks and possibly getting rid of gold reserves, thus ending the policy of deflation practiced by the Treasury and the Bank of England, the Labour leadership did not support the programme. In particular, MacDonald objected to the slogan, "'Socialism in our time' as he viewed socialism as a gradual process. For the duration of the second Labour government 1929-31, 37 Labour MPs were sponsored by the ILP, but none were appointed to the cabinet. Instead, the group provided the left opposition to the Labour leadership. 
The 1930 ILP conference decided that where their policies diverged from the Labour Party their MPs should break the whip to support the ILP policy. Topic 1931 ILP Scottish Conference It was becoming clearer that the ILP was diverging further away from the Labour Party and at the 1931 ILP Scottish Conference the issue of whether the party should still affiliate to Labour was discussed. It was decided to continue to do so, but only after Maxton himself intervened in the debate. Topic. From disaffiliation to the Second World War At the 1931 general election the ILP candidates refused to accept the standing orders of the Parliamentary Labour Party and stood without Labour Party support. Five ILP members were returned to Westminster and created an ILP group outside the Labour Party. In 1932 a special conference of the ILP voted to disaffiliate from Labour. The same year the ILP co-founded the London Bureau of Left Socialist Parties, later called the International Revolutionary Marxist Centre or Three and a Half International, administered by the ILP and chaired by its leader, Fenner Brockway, for most of its existence. The Labour left winger Anurin Bevan described the ILP's disaffiliation as a decision to remain pure, but impotent. Outside the Labour Party, the ILP went into decline. In just three years it lost 75% of its members, the total falling from 16,773 in 1932 to 4,392 in 1935, as it lost adherents to the Labour Party, the Communist Party of Great Britain CPGB, and the Trotskyists. Some members of the ILP who had chosen to remain within the Labour Party were instrumental in creating the Socialist League, while the majority of Scottish members left to form the Scottish Socialist Party and members in Northern Ireland left en masse to form the Socialist Party of Northern Ireland. In 1934 a breakaway group in the northwest of England left to form the Independent Socialist Party. The remaining ILP membership tended to be young and radical. They were particularly active in supporting the Republican side in the Spanish Civil War, and around 25 members and sympathizers, including George Orwell, went to Spain as members of an ILP contingent of volunteers to assist the Workers' Party of Marxist Unification POUM, a sister party to the ILP in the Three and a Half International. From the mid-1930s onwards the ILP also attracted the attention of the Trotskyist movement, and various Trotskyist groups worked within it, notably the Marxist group, of which C. L. R. James, Denzel Dean Harbour and Ted Grant were members. There was also a group of ILP members, the Revolutionary Policy Committee, who were sympathetic to the CPGB and eventually left to join that party. From the late 1930s the ILP had the support of several key figures in the tiny Pan-Africanist movement in Britain, including George Padmore and Chris Braithwaite, as well as left-wing writers such as George Orwell, Reginald Reynolds and Ethel Mannon. 
In 1939 the ILP wrote to the Labour Party requesting reaffiliation subject to a right to advocate its own policies where it had a «conscientious objection» to Labour policy. Labour refused to agree to this condition, stating that its usual rules for affiliation could not be waived for the ILP. <laughs> World War II and beyond As in 1914 the ILP opposed World War II on ethical grounds and turned to the left. One aspect of its leftist policies in this period was that it opposed the wartime truce between the major parties and actively contested parliamentary elections. In one such contest, the Cardiff East by-election in 1942, this was with the result that Fenner Brockway, the ILP candidate, found himself opposed by a conservative candidate for whom the local Communist Party actively campaigned. The ILP still had some significant strength at the end of the war, but it went into crisis shortly afterwards. At the 1945 general election it retained three MPs, all in Glasgow, although only one of them had a Labour opponent. Its conference rejected calls to reaffiliate to the Labour Party. A major blow came in 1946 when the party's best-known public spokesman, James Maxton MP, died. The ILP narrowly held his seat in the Glasgow Bridgeton by-election, 1946, against a Labour opponent. However, all its MPs defected to Labour at various stages in 1947, and the party was roundly defeated at the Glasgow Camlachie by-election, 1948, in a seat it had won easily only three years earlier. The party was never again able to win a significant vote in a parliamentary election. Despite these blows, the ILP continued. Throughout the 1950s and into the early 1960s it pioneered opposition to nuclear weapons and sought to publicize ideas such as workers' control. It also maintained links with the remnants of its fraternal groups, such as the POUM, who were in exile, as well as campaigning for decolonization. In the 1970s the ILP reassessed its views on the Labour Party, and in 1975 it renamed itself Independent Labour Publications and became a pressure group inside Labour. Topic. List of chairs Topic. Other notable members Topic. Conferences of the ILP Source, online register of the ILP archives at the British Library of Political and Economic Science, https colon slash slash archive dot is slash two o one two o seven one six o six three six four four slash http colon slash slash library dash two dot else dot act dot uke slash archives slash handlists slash ilp slash ilp html topic election results topic footnotes <laughs> 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 
Topic See also Independent Labour Party election results Scottish Labour Party 1888 to 1893 Topic Further reading Gideon Cohen, The Failure of a Dream, The Independent Labour Party from Disaffiliation to World War II. I. B. Tories, 2007. Robert E. Dowes, Left in the Center, The Independent Labour Party, 1893-1940. London, Longmans, 1966. June Hannam and Karen Hunt, Socialist Women, Britain, 1880s to 1920s. London, Routledge, 2002. David Howell, British Workers and the Independent Labour Party, 1888 to 1906. Manchester, Manchester University Press, 1983. David Howell, MacDonald's Party, Labour Identities and Crisis 1922–1931. Oxford University Press, 2007. David James, Tony Jowett and Keith Laybourne eds. The Centennial History of the Independent Labour Party. Halifax, Ribburn, 1992. Alan McKinley and R. J. Morris, eds. The ILP on Clydeside, 1893 to 1932: From Foundation to Disintegration. Manchester, Manchester University Press, 1991. Henry Pelling, The Origins of the Labour Party. London, Macmillan, 1954. External links Byers, Michael. ILP, Independent Labour Party. Published on Red Clydeside, A History of the Labour Movement in Glasgow, a project of the Glasgow Digital Library. Retrieved 4 October 2009. Ryan, Mordecai. Britain's Biggest Left Party, 1893–1945, and What Became of It, The History of the ILP. Published in Solidarity, Organ of the Alliance for Workers' Liberty Issue 385, 8 December 2005. Retrieved 4 October 2009. Cox, Judy. Skinning a Live Tiger Paw by Paw, Reform, Revolution and Labor. International Socialism, retrieved 4 October 2009. Archives of the Independent Labor Party are held at LSE Library. An online catalogue of these papers is available.